So I'm going to be talking today about offline first apps with PouchDB. And what I want to do is I want to encourage you to think about how your application works when you don't have an internet connection, when your users don't have an internet connection, or when they have limited access to, to the network. How many of you have ever seen an app like this? Right? OK. In all honesty, how many have built an app like this? No, again, yeah, of course, your colleagues have. Not you haven't done it. But how, many, how many of your colleagues have built an app like this? There we go. So that's that question. Um, so it's all too easy to assume that you can just write a mobile backend, your app will connect to that mobile backend, and all's good. But in reality, networks don't work so well. So, um, and you end up with silly things like this. So I'm sure most of you have heard of mobile first. Uh, in case you haven't, the basic idea of mobile first is to design the mobile version of your application first, and then progressively enhance that application as you have larger and larger screen real estate available to you, to your application. And I want to encourage you to keep doing mobile first, but I also want you to think about uh, building offline first. The basic premise of offline first is that you shouldn't treat uh, being offline as an error condition. So the first question that you might ask is, well, we've got pretty good connectivity most places. Doesn't ubiquitous connectivity make offline-enabled apps unnecessary? And I would argue that no, it doesn't. And I'd actually say it's the opposite, that ubiquitous connectivity is actually driving the demand for offline capabilities. And how's that? That seems like a little bit strange thing for me to say. Who's heard of the fallacies of distributed computing? Anybody heard of these before? OK, so this is a set of assumptions that uh, developers and other people often make about the network. And it's easy when you're building your app to, to assume that your network's always going to be reliable, that you're going to have zero latency, that you're going to have infinite bandwidth available to you. And in reality, this isn't how networks work. So, if you want to achieve a true 100% always-on user experience, offline first is the only way to go. Because the reality is that your users want an app that works all the time. Ubiquitous connectivity has made it so that users want that device in their pocket all the time, working all the time. But the reality is that networks can never be 100% reliable. But with an offline first approach, you can provide that usability to your users, that experience of the app always working, uh, and then by storing data, for example, locally on a device and then synchronizing to, to a cloud database or otherwise. But I want to encourage you more broadly, though, to think about this approach, this offline first approach. And there are a bunch of benefits to an offline first approach. Uh, one of the most interesting benefits is that you can actually create a faster user experience. Because all of your create, read, update, delete operations are happening, all your data access is happening locally on the device, you can actually create really fast user interfaces. Of course, obviously, offline first apps work offline. So in those conditions, those scenarios where your users uh, don't have a network connection, they can continue to, to use your app. Another important consideration is uh, disaster scenarios. So situations where networks might be congested, for example. Uh, another thing around this is that uh, there's actually studies that show that if you can batch up your network requests, so in other words, not have network chatter going back and forth all the time, uh, if you can batch those network requests, say synchronizing data periodically uh, versus all the time, there's actually studies that show that that will reduce the battery and bandwidth consumption on devices. So really a bunch of uh, uh, benefits here to taking an offline first approach. So I want to look at a few different apps and how they work offline. So this isn't to um, pick on any particular app. Um, so I just chose these because these are some apps that I use occasionally, and I was just playing around with how they work offline. So please, if there's anybody in the room for any of these places, uh, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just want to use these as a, as a, a point of discussion. So this is the, the Eventbrite app. When you uh, first uh, load, load it up, you get this error message that um, we're having difficulty loading orders. This is if, if I'm in airplane mode. I think they've actually updated this since I took this screenshot, so maybe someone from Eventbrite saw my, one of my talks. 
uh, and changed it. Um, but um, now, to their credit, though, if you just hit OK, uh, you can still see your you can still see your data. So Eventbrite app actually does work offline. It just gives you that error message, or at least it used to give you that error message for really no, no good reason at the, at the beginning. So uh, this is uh, the Weather app uh, in iOS. So Weather app actually works offline too. Um, it just gives you this error message when you first load it. Now, of course, if I got on a plane six hours ago, and that's when my app actually was able to load its data, weather data, then that data might be outdated. So the weather could have changed drastically in that six hours that I've been on the plane. So in this scenario, it might make sense to still show the user cached data, to show the user stale data, but maybe let the user know that that's outdated and that they might not want to completely rely on that information because it could be, could be old data. Uh, Slack. Slack in general isn't really, doesn't have a great offline support, uh, but here's one example where it works fairly well. Uh, if you've been online but you lose your connection, drop connection a little bit, it'll come up with this uh, offline message at the top. Nothing too obtrusive. It doesn't pop up with a modal dialogue or anything. It just, it just lets you know it's, been, it's offline. But you can still see your most recent conversations. You can scroll up a little bit and see some of your history. So that's useful because I might, there might be a conversation that I want to reference and I want to get some information from, so I can still do that. Of course, uh, calendars. Calendars are great. Uh, you still want to see your calendar data even if you don't have an internet connection. So there are a bunch of different ways to do offline first. There are a lot of different technologies out there and a lot of different approaches. So I just want to talk today about one particular technology, and that's PouchDB, and that's pouch with a P. Uh, PouchDB is actually based on Apache CouchDB, and that's couch with a C. Uh, so I'll try to enunciate here to make sure you know which one I'm talking about. Um, but basically, PouchDB is CouchDB shrunk down to fit in your web browser. So the awesome thing about PouchDB is that it can replicate with anything that implements the CouchDB replication protocol. So that includes, of course, CouchDB, uh, includes other instances of PouchDB, and includes uh, Cloudant, which is the product that I, wor I work on. Uh, Cloudant is a fully managed database as a service. Uh, it's a product of IBM, a uh, startup that got, got acquired a little while ago from IBM. So there are, I want to talk about three, uh, four different use cases for uh, PouchDB uh, apps. Now, the awesome thing about PouchDB is that it's, it's a JavaScript database. So it's a JavaScript database that syncs, and it, since it's JavaScript, JavaScript can run anywhere. Uh, we can run JavaScript in a whole bunch of different types of apps. So that means that PouchDB can also run in those, in those environments. So of course, front-end web apps. So if you're building web apps, HTML5, CSS, JavaScript web apps, uh, and you're using responsive design, you can, you can use PouchDB in those and actually store your data within the browser. So in a browser context, PouchDB is actually using either IndexedDB or, uh, or some other form of local storage uh, under the hood, but it's providing a nice abstraction layer plus synchronization capabilities on top of that. A uh, cool thing about PouchDB is there's also a bunch of plugins available for it. So you've got plugins for uh, Angular, for, um, uh, for a bunch of other um, front-end frameworks, and if you combine this along with things like service workers, you can actually create fully offline-first, offline-enabled apps that work in the browser. Now, of course, the user is going to have to visit the app once to begin with to get, to get it. But once they've loaded that into their browser, that app can now work offline. Uh, PouchDB will also run in Node.js. So you can actually use PouchDB as the database for your Node.js apps. Uh, you can simply install PouchDB through NPM. Uh, it's just called PouchDB, surprisingly. Um, you could also install PouchDB Server if you'd like. So PouchDB Server actually will provide, provides a drop-in replacement for CouchDB. So it actually provides the full HTTP API, or pretty close to the full HTTP API of CouchDB, but fully in a, in a Node.js environment. So that's pretty cool. Uh, mobile apps. So if you're building hybrid apps, so you're using uh, Cordova or PhoneGap or Ionic, uh, those sorts of tools where you can actually use HTML5, CSS, JavaScript tooling 
and compile that to run as a, as a native app. Um, and you can run PouchDB in this environment as well. So using PouchDB as the database for your, for your native app. So this is awesome for creating uh, fully featured cross-platform native apps. Um, if you, some people prefer to actually build native apps using the native tooling. In that case, you could still take this, use this approach, but for high fidelity prototypes. So to create your prototypes and then go on and build a, a native app using the native tooling. So if you're someone that prefers to do uh, native app development, uh, we've also open sourced our Cloud and Sync libraries for iOS and Android, so you can use those as uh, those work in a similar way to PouchDB, where they'll store data locally uh, on, a, on a device. Of course, uh, desktop apps. Uh, they, who's heard of Electron? Pretty, uh, pretty popular, pretty cool. Uh, Electron used to be called Atom Shell, so you can actually build desktop apps uh, with no JS tooling, using HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, um, and PouchDB will run in Electron as well. So you can use PouchDB as the database there. So, so again, pretty, pretty neat. And finally, Internet of Things. There's a whole track here at this conference on Internet of Things and how you can run Node.js on Internet of Things devices. So you could actually run PouchDB as the database on a device. Uh, say, for example, it was a sensor collecting some sort of uh, sensor data. It could store that data locally on the device, assuming there's some sort of storage capability on that device. And then as it has internet connection, say that it has a spotty connection, it could actually sync that data and send that, send that data to the cloud as needed. Uh, so this is a pretty, uh, pretty short um, time slot, so I don't have a ton of time to go over these code examples, so I'm just gonna go through this pretty quickly. Uh, so, but I just wanna give you a sense of how PouchDB works. So if you want to check this out in more depth, uh, check out this uh, GitHub repo that I've got. Uh, I'm Bradley-Holt on GitHub. I've got this offline-first uh, repository you can check out. Uh, so for each of these examples, I've created, uh, there's a link, there's a GitHub repo link. Uh, so the examples on the slides are, are condensed, so the full examples, though, are on GitHub. I've also created a JS fiddle uh, for each of the examples, so you can actually run them in your browser if you want to try them out. And then if you scroll down on this page even further, there's um, links to a bunch of different boilerplates and other tools uh, for some of those different use cases that I just talked about. So definitely uh, check that out if you wanna dive in and, and learn more. So PouchDB stores uh, data in uh, JSON uh, documents. So, uh, so this is just a JSON object with a couple special fields. Uh, underscore ID field, which is our primary key, so it uniquely identifies every document. And a revision field, or underscore rev field, uh, which does optimistic concurrency. It allows PouchDB to not have to ever, ever lock the database. Uh, so it allows you to optimistically, uh, just optimistic concurrency for, for updating, updating documents. So creating a local database uh, with PouchDB is very difficult, as you can see here, uh, with this one line of code. Um, so uh, we we'll just do this one line, var db equals new PouchDB, and the name of the database we want to create. That simple, really easy. So. If this database doesn't exist already, it will go ahead and create it for us. Otherwise, it will just give us a reference to that existing database. And this is creating a local database on the device. So if it's a browser, it's creating it in the browser using IndexedDB or some other form of local storage. Uh, if it's, um, and again, depending on if it's using, a, um, if it's in a hybrid mobile app, it could be using WebSQL under the hood. But whatever is appropriate for that particular environment, it's gonna actually create that uh, data store under the hood. A uh, cool thing about PouchDB is you can also use it as a client library uh, to reference a remote database, and, but it gives you the exact same API whether you're looking, working with a local database or a remote database. Uh, the only difference is that when you instantiate the PouchDB object, you're uh, passing a URL instead of a name of the database. And if this database doesn't exist already, it will actually try to create it for me if I have appropriate permissions. So this is just a database, cloud database on, in my cloud account. So if you're gonna do anything with remote databases though, um, you're gonna wanna enable cores. This is, a, if you, this is if you're in a browser environment, uh, just a security restriction that browsers have. Uh, you can do this easily enough in cloud in, in the dashboard. Just go ahead and enable cores. Uh, of course, you wanna be aware of the security implications of this, uh, which I don't have time to get into right here, right now, but um, if you're just playing around though, just go ahead and check the enable cores. But if you're ever doing anything more serious, definitely make sure you understand this in, in more depth. So creating a new document, um, 
So we're using this db.put method. Uh, we're just passing a JSON object. Uh, we're specifying an ID, underscore ID field. You could also use db.post if you want, in which case it will uh, choose an ID for you. For the most part, you want to use put and specify an ID. This is because there's a, a primary key based on that ID field, which you can actually query against. You can create secondary indexes too, but that primary index, um, if you have a primary index that makes sense, that is some sort of natural key, it actually makes querying the database easier. Uh, updating a document, so I'm putting the document in the database, uh, and then I'm just getting it back up, out, I'm doing an update, updating the number of kilowatt hours there, and then um, doing a, a db.put to putting it back in the database. So, pretty easy. Uh, deleting a document, same idea, I just do db.remove instead. So, <clears throat> you can also query, um, like I said, there's a primary key you can query against, that ID field, so you can use this all docs method to query against that. So here I'm just creating a bunch of documents using this bulk docs API, and then I'm doing db.alldocs, and this include docs option, um, if, you don't if you don't include that, it's gonna just give you the metadata of the documents, so, um, like the ID in the rev field, for example. Uh, so if you do include docs, you can get all the, all the data about each document. So this, by default, this is just gonna give me all the documents in my database. Not particularly helpful, or, or it could be, maybe, but more likely you're gonna to wanna to use some of these additional options. Uh, for example, querying for a specific key or keys or a specific range. Uh, so all docs can actually get pretty powerful once you start playing around with these options. Uh, if you need to query against something other than the ID field, though, you can create secondary indexes, and that's uh, a couple ways you can do that. Uh, one way is with um, uh, writing MapReduce views. So you're writing a map function that uh, goes through all the documents in your database, creates a, creates a secondary index based on the function that you, JavaScript function that you define, uh, and then you can query against that index. And they can optionally have a reduce field, like some count or stats. Uh, if you don't want to play around with MapReduce, something a little bit simpler is uh, PouchDB Find. This is a plugin, open source plugin to PouchDB. Um, this is actually based on something that we released a while back at Cloudant called Cloudant Query. Uh, we open sourced it, it got contributed to CouchDB, and then uh, someone in the PouchDB community created a, a plugin based on it. So basically the idea is you can just say, I want to query against the, this timestamp field, or I want to query against this uh, last name field, and we'll actually create an index for you declaratively that you can then go query against. So if you're struggling with how to query PouchDB, I'd definitely check out PouchDB Find. It's probably the simplest way to, simplest way to work with it. Uh, listening for changes, so you can actually, um, uh, this is cool, you can actually do uh, live updates to your user interface based on changes in the database. So you can actually hook this in and uh, get these events triggered. Uh, live replication, so you can actually replicate uh, live between uh, your local database and your remote database. So here I'm setting up a local database, a remote database, and then I do this uh, db.sync method where I actually sync my local and my remote. So it's gonna do a bidirectional replication pulling data from the local to the remote and remote to the local. Um, pretty cool. So again, I've got all these code examples, uh, bradley-holt slash offline-first on GitHub. Uh, check them out. Uh, if you got any questions, uh, we're almost out of time. We've got about another minute. Uh, happy to take some questions now or come find me at the IBM booth. I'll be there um, this afternoon. So yeah, we have one question. Yeah, so with the browser, it's gonna be based on, so the question was, um, how, what are size restrictions on the data that can be stored uh, in a browser environment? And it's gonna be based on the underlying technology, whether it's IndexedDB or WebSQL or whatever it's using. Uh, there's a whole chart I didn't include in this presentation just because it's pretty short, but um, there's a chart on the PouchDB uh, website that goes through all those, but you're talking in the range of like, it's pretty small, typically like 20 meg, ish is probably about, give or take five to 20, maybe more, depending on the browser. Um, so it's really gonna be, you're not gonna store your entire database there, you're gonna store data that's probably relevant to that particular user or what that user is doing at the moment or likely to be doing in the, in the near future, so, yeah. You know, quick follow-up sure. question, sorry. Yeah. Um, Storage so that you can eliminate that 
Uh, yes. So, it's, so the question was, um, if you're doing like a, if you're doing a hybrid app like Cordova or PhoneGap or that sort of thing, um, it does it use the backend storage to eliminate those sorts of restrictions? And, and yes, it's going to use something like a SQL Lite, for example, or or something that's going to have a much higher limit. So if you're not in a web environment, if you're in like a, a hybrid mobile app environment, you're going to have a lot more storage to work with. So, uh, other question? Yeah. So the question was about security. Uh, how do you, yeah, authorization and security, and how do you account for what data can sync with, with different users? And uh, there's a couple different ways to approach that. Uh, one, of, one common approach is what's called one database per user, where you actually give each user their own database, both in the cloud and locally on the, the device, and that's the database that they sync with. So you only put the data that's relevant for that user in their database and only let them synchronize with their own database and give them access to that, that particular database. Yep. Yeah, like with Cloudin, for example, you could have a Cloudin database for each of your users and then just point the, each user to their own database to synchronize with. There's some other intricacies to that, but it, that's the basic idea. Uh, yeah. So the question was around, uh, I believe the question is around conflicts, is I think it was ultimately where you're getting at uh, when you have multiple users updating a document. So the way PouchDB and CouchDB works is that um, if two users have updated the same document and those, that gets replicated, it's gonna automatically pick a winner with a deterministic algorithm, um, and then it's gonna mark it as conflicted, and then you as an application developer need to go write some logic to find those conflicts and resolve it with logic that makes sense for your application. Uh, so with that, I think we're over time, so I should probably wrap it up. But uh, I'll stick around here. Folks have additional questions, feel free to come up. And uh, again, I'll be at the IBM booth if you have any other questions to think of. Thank you.